Okay, excellent. Thank you. And we've got a, a crowd here, and we've also got people connected online. So I just want to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Narita Hyatt. She's a lecturer and advisor in occupational therapy at La Trobe Rural Health School at La Trobe University, the largest rural health school in Australia. And for those of you who don't know the time difference, it is currently 6.30 a.m. for Narita. So thank you so much for getting up this early, Narita. We really appreciate it. Um, you have expertise in participation-based research methods that involve consumer and community participation using co-design and co-production. And your teaching scholarship is interlinked and focused on how to develop allied health graduates, cultural capabilities, which are critical for working with socially and culturally diverse communities, including First Nations peoples. And you're going to talk to us today a little bit about building um, healthy rural communities through participation. So thanks so much, Narada. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Thanks so much for being here uh, for this presentation today uh, at University of Manitoba and online. I'm really grateful to Leanne Leclerc for organising this and Leanne Allen for organising the um, ICT and all the technology that goes into putting these presentations together. So thank you very much. Um, I will start off with the, an acknowledgement of country. So in Australia, it's a cultural protocol that we acknowledge whose uh, land we're on and the land of the First Nations people. So currently I'm in a place called Bendigo, which is situated on Jar Jar Rung country, which is in the state of Victoria in Australia. So I'd like to first off recognise the Jar Jar Wurrung people as the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So introductions. Um, I am at the Rural Health School in Bendigo, which is part of La Trobe University. So I'm not sure if, um, maybe just raise your hand if you've heard of La Trobe University before so I can get an idea of who's heard of that. And uh, sorry, I can't see people online. Excellent, pretty much everybody, which is fantastic. So La Trobe University uh, is a, one of the large universities based in Australia. I've been working at La Trobe University for 10 years now, actually. Um, but most of that time was part-time while I was working as an occupational therapist in clinical work um, at a place called Bendigo Community Health Services, which is one of the rural community health services um, that is a, a non-government type service that provides a whole range of primary care and community health services to the rural region. Uh, so I worked there and also in a mental health service at that time as well, a place called Headspace. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that. It's quite um, becoming increasingly uh, well known internationally for providing youth mental health services that are focused on uh, uh, early intervention, education and prevention. Uh, so for me, my, uh, I worked part-time at La Trobe and part-time in clinical work for most of that time uh, until I finished my PhD, which was th almost three years ago now. And since then, I've worked full-time at La Trobe as an occ uh, occupational therapy lecturer. Uh, and just this year, I've taken on the role of the local course coordinator, so the Bendigo course advisor, running the Bendigo course, which is the rural course, uh, which is focused on providing, um, well, training up our rural graduates, which is one of the things I'll be talking about today. Um, the photos in my presentation are by my sister. My sister's a photographer locally, so the photos are provided by her, which I hope you'll enjoy and help you to get a sense of who I am and where I'm from. So this is where Bendigo is. Um, so on the, um, on your, so I've got the Australia map over here, um, where, and you can see little Bendigo is in the middle of um, central Victoria, right down the bottom here. Um, it's about a two-hour uh, train ride or drive from Melbourne, right in the middle inland um, of the state. So no beaches, <laughs> quite dry. Um, it's a beautiful town, um, and I've, I've lived here all my life. My family are all from here. The population is about 150,000 now, which has grown a lot over the last 10 years. Um, and like I said, this is situated on Jar Jar Rurung country. So on the map on the other side are the language group names of the First Nations people. And you can see we're situated in the middle here. So just a little bit about the Latrobe Rural Health School, because I know some of you are an, an, uh, from different disciplines. Um, and some of you are also planning to come and visit Latrobe Rural Health School. So I thought I'd give you a little overview of, of what this school is about. So, and it also helps to inform why I'm focusing my presentation on building healthy rural communities. 
Um, so La Trobe Rural Health School is the largest rural health school in Australia. We have over 3,000 students from 11 different disciplines. Our main campus, where I'm located uh, right now, like I said, is Bendigo, but we also have campuses at Albury, Wodonga, Shepparton and Mildura. And we have really strong partnerships with the local hospitals and health services right across the region, um, right up to Mildura, which is a four-hour drive away from Bendigo, to give you an idea of the distance that we cover. Because we do have 11 different disciplines, we're really strong in um, multidisciplinary research as well. Um, which is a really great way of yeah, doing research that is important for rural communities. My research is also aligned with the Violet Marshman Rural Health Initiative, which is led by Professor Amanda Kenny, who I know has visited the University of Manitoba uh, quite a few times now and has some strong partnerships there with a range of faculty, including the nursing faculty. So Professor Mandy Kenny leads up this new rural health initiative that uh, was launched last year and we're on our way to becoming a research centre. Uh, it's funded through philanthropic funding from a rural nurse um, who left the money uh, in her will and it's organised through a trust through her three sons. And they really want this research to be focused on high impact rural research that includes consumer and community participation and has a direct impact on the health and well-being of rural communities. So my research is aligned through this program. So my presentation today is going to focus on three questions which will explore this overall um, theme and my overall research program of building healthy rural communities through participation. So the three themes that I'm focusing on today, the first one is what is community? Because community is a term that's often used which um, is quite complex and can mean different things to different people. So that's the first question. Um, the second question is, can rural health inequities be addressed through community participation? I'll, I'll explore the reasons why I think that they, they can be and the rationale for that. And I'll also talk about the role of the health workforce, which will mainly focus on my discipline of occupational therapy, but I think there's lessons that can be learned across disciplines when we explore our own discipline. So I'll talk about that and how the research that I'm doing is helping to support growth and development of the health workforce, particularly the rural health workforce, because that's my particular area of interest. So the first question, what is community? So the simple answer is that there actually is no standard definition of community, um, which some people might find quite complexing, especially if you haven't thought about this question before. Um, but probably quite a few of you have. So you're nodding your heads most likely. There is no standard definition. Um, there are different interpretations across disciplines and fields. Um, and that when we do look across disciplines and fields, we can see some key characteristics that really help us to understand what the term community actually means. So those key characteristics are that um, communities involve people who are linked by social and cultural connections, that communities are associated with place, but also they could be associated with setting that might not be a geographic location, such as virtual communities. And communities also have people who have uh, some kind of shared purpose um, and or identity or actions. And some communities might be characterised by a particular kind of participation or things they do together. Um, but for others, it might be more about a purpose or some other kind of shared identity. And that can be different across communities. Um, one author, Yerby, uh, recommended that rather than having a definition of community, we talk about having a vocabulary of community, and this helps us to understand what the term actually means. So there's a whole range of different terms that are sometimes used interchangeably, um, but sometimes it's the words that are used surrounding community that can help us to understand what it means and what the meaning is in different contexts. So when I asked occupational therapists at a state conference during a workshop, we created this word cloud together, which helps us to understand the vocabulary of community. Um, helps us to come together in terms of finding a meaning. So the key things to think about when asking this question, what is community, is that we always have to remember that community is diverse. Because sometimes I think we can automatically think of community as a, as a homogenous group. So we need to really be thinking about communities as being diverse. From my uh, doctoral research, with, uh, I did uh, research with communities and looked at community participation in rural Australia and in urban Canada, actually, in food security programs in Toronto, Montreal and Halifax. 
Um, and from this research, I found that community is defined in this way. So the image is something I developed through that doctoral research. Um, and what I found was that community in, within communities, um, people participate in really different ways, but they're still part of this community network. Um, the, the community network includes people, yes, but also includes these networks, groups, organisations, even businesses. And that community is inter interrelated with place and setting, yes, um, but there's also really important context to community that help us to understand what this is and helps us to understand the diversity. And when we think about communities, we need to think about context, including the, the physical, um, but also the virtual, social, cultural, economic and political. And in political, we also think about historical. So this uh, conceptualization of community and I suppose um, this complex conceptualization of community is really important for health initiatives to avoid that um, homogenous view of communities um, but also to help us understand how to engage with communities and how to foster or build this community participation. So using this definition it can help us or help us to work with health services to build multiple methods of community participation, knowing that people will want to participate in their community in different ways, and not everyone wants to do the same thing at all times. Um, and health practitioners and researchers need skills for really analysing the community, understanding the context, and understanding that context and analysing the power dynamics in community. This is really important um, because I suppose what I've seen through my work, um, so my clinical practice and my research here with rural health communities, is often they only have very simple methods of community participation, such as the consumer representative on the board, uh, on a, on a, a committee, um, but really they need to be thinking about broadening those multiple methods of community participation to get a diversity of inputs. So let's go to the next question, which builds on this. Can rural health inequities be addressed through community participation? So this is often the argument that's put forward when we talk about rural health. Um, I'm not sure if this is similar in Canada, and maybe I'll get you to nod um, or shake your head if you disagree, um, but often there's a deficit-based discourse around rural health in Australia. So often when people talk about rural health, they talk about all the things that are wrong with rural communities. They talk about how people living in rural areas generally experience poorer health compared with people living in metropolitan areas, which is true, um, especially when we look at the statistics nationally. Um, and they talk about how we have, we, because I'm a rural person, we have higher rates of chronic disease, we have poor, poorer access to and use of health services, um, and they talk about our shorter life expectancy. So it's quite grim. And this is the way that rural health is often spoken about in the Australian context. So I wonder if you could just shake your head or nod if, you, if this is similar in Canada or different. Mm. Uh, so the map on the side here helps us to understand what rural actually looks like in the Australian context as well. Um, so hopefully you can see the dark blue areas of Australia are the very remote um, and then the lighter blue areas are classified as remote. The green areas are classified as outer regional and then the yellow areas are counted as inner regional and the red is metropolitan. So even just looking at this map we can see that when we talk about rural um, there are different layers of rural in the Australian context as well. Um, so those living in inner regional, those living in outer regional and remote and very remote might have very different experiences but are often um, spoken about in terms of the, um, the same definition, so this same definition of being rural. Um, so sometimes that's helpful because it does help us to understand that what's different about living in rural and regional areas compared to metropolitan cities and that there are major differences. But sometimes it can be unhelpful because it masks this diversity of rural communities that I've just spoken about in terms of um, when we look at a community, the diversity that's inherent within that. So this is often what's presented. So in Australia, if you go to a rural health conference or you hear um, from a rural health researcher, this is the um, narrative or the, the story that's often um, spoken about. So now I've done this, I'm going to move on. This is what I prefer to talk about when I talk about rural health. 
So I prefer to talk about the strength-based argument for working in rural areas and for doing research and, and delivering health services in rural communities. So working in rural areas, there's a lot of potential strengths and opportunities, uh, and this is something that I like to focus on with my research. So rural communities are diverse, very diverse. So you've seen on that map there's diversity in terms of um, geography, in terms of population, but also in terms of social, cultural, political contexts. Um, rural communities present a whole range of strengths and opportunities for doing health services differently to metropolitan services. But at the moment in Australia, rural health service models are often modelled off metropolitan service models and they're not taking advantage or not utilising all these strengths and opportunities that are available to them. So here are some of the strengths and opportunities using some of the national statistics and current research. So people living in rural and regional areas are more likely to engage in volunteering in comparison to people living in metropolitan centres. People aged 65 years and older commonly volunteer with welfare and community organisations, which again creates these um, opportunities for engaging people who volunteer. Rural people who volunteer are more likely to attend community events. They're more likely to be a member of a school or some other kind of group, which could be a sporting club or other kind of hobby group. They're more likely to be involved in other aspects of community life. Um, and they're more likely to report higher levels of trust, safety and life satisfaction, which are all important to participation initiatives. Um, and the picture here on this slide is a very important cultural festival that happens in Bendigo once a year over Easter. Um, it started um, through the Bendigo Chinese Association um, from the Chinese people that um, migrated to Bendigo during the gold rush. Um, so they started this festival as a way of bringing together people living in Bendigo with the Chinese immigrants who are there for the gold fields. And it's something that happens every year. <clears throat> it's a major event. If you're here during April, you'll get to see it. So rural community resources can be mobilised to address health and social issues. We know that this is possible. And we know that we can do this by investing in local leaders, by resourcing voluntary groups and networks, and then building partnerships between these existing networks and groups. And this is something that could be done more, um, especially in a health service context, um, in rural areas to create these different or uh, more innovative service models. So here are some examples of, um, I have two examples to talk about from research that has happened with the Rural Community Health Services through La Trobe Rural Health School, and I've been involved in, in some of this work. So the first example is of Warwick Nabil, uh, which is a, a very small town um, a few hours north of Bendigo um, that has a very excellent high quality health service um, that spans over a couple of the smaller towns. Um, so they're called Rural Northwest Health. So uh, one of the projects that we did with them uh, was building community participation between um, yeah, the community and the regional uh, rural health service, Rural Northwest Health. Um, and through this project, I actually shared my research findings um, from the food security networks and organisations in Canada with this service. And what they decided to do was to build a community garden on the hospital grounds. Um, so this is what they did. So the community action resource group that developed through this project, um, they learned about what happened in Canada, but also through a whole range of other initiatives, they did this action research process and decided to build this community garden. Um, so they build the community garden on the hospital grounds, um, and now they're incorporating some of their programs with that community garden. So the um, dietitian is doing workshops there. Um, but it's also a way that they're trying to increase intergenerational social connections. So here's one example of the potential in rural health. Here's the second example. So Heathcote Health is actually part of the city of Greater Bendigo, but it's about half an hour drive outside of town, which means it's quite, uh, it's, it can feel quite isolated and people in Heathcote can feel quite isolated from central Bendigo. Um, and especially the younger people there and the older people. There's a, a larger proportion of younger people, a larger proportion of older people. Um, and because it is half an hour out of town it, and there is no public transport, it's quite hard for people to make those connections into town and to access services. 
So what Heathcote Health and Heathcote again were part of this research project that we did where we worked with the health service um, to build community participation um, and, they, and they did that over a period of time and, what, and um, through that community participation what they've decided to do is create this dementia friendly village. Now I'm not sure if you've heard of dementia friendly villages before, I think they're quite popular now. Um, so this, is, this will be a township that's created in Heathcote to support people who are diagnosed with dementia so they can still access the community. And what they do is they train local people up so they can support them, but they also look at the community itself and the environmental design and make sure that this is an inclusive and safe environment for people living with dementia. So this is quite innovative, especially for a small rural town but again, it shows the potential of what we can achieve through building community participation to improve health in our rural communities. Okay, so there's lots of potential here. I hope you can see the potential and the strengths um, that we could be utilising for rural health. Um, but there are also challenges. This otherwise, you know, this would already be happening. Um, so there are challenges for addressing rural health inequities through community participation. One of them, and a major one, is the risk of shifting responsibility from the health service to the community and expecting people to take on that massive responsibility for people's health and wellbeing. Um, and that's something that needs to be closely analysed and looked at through these power dynamics but by making sure that the resources are there and things like sustainability are looked at to ensure that this is done in an appropriate way. There's also that difficulty of conceptualising the community as the client, if you want to use that word, in a health service context. So when people think about client-centred care, instead of thinking about individuals, we need to be thinking about communities as the client and then how to tailor the services and programs to that community. Um, and many of the um, health professionals that I speak with, again, have that quite um, simplified version, uh, simplified definition of community, or maybe just haven't stopped to think about what that definition is. Um, they might not have that complex conceptualisation that I presented at the start of the presentation. So they need more uh, knowledge and education on what this actually looks like. Um, and there's a lack of understanding of how to work with communities in mainstream allied health workforce. Um, some allied health disciplines are doing a lot more of this than others. Um, so public health practitioners are definitely have a better understanding in comparison to some allied health workforce. Um, and for some of allied health professionals, this is a new and emerging concept. So I know we have a dentistry and oral health program at La Trobe Rural Health School, and this is something they're starting to do more and more of in their program. Um, so we're, we're, with the allied health workforce, we have people at, at different levels of understanding. Um, so this is something we need to work on, especially through our education programs. And then there's the actual service system and our funding models. And again, I'm not sure if this is the same in Canada, but in Australia, they're very individual focused. Um, and when we do look at research with, um, I've looked at research, and I'll talk about some of this today actually, uh, research with occupational therapists, for example, but when we look at research with people working in community health centres, they say they want to do this work but there's a lack of funding and a lack of, a lack of flexibility in that funding for them to be able to do this work. So there's issues there with the actual service system and funding models that we need to address in order to support these initiatives. So a few challenges to overcome. So what we do as researchers with these challenges is we try and overcome them through research and then impacting on policy. Um, so this is the third part of the presentation today that I'd like to speak with you about. And the, so the third question, um, what is the role of the health workforce? And I'm going to share some of my research to talk about how I'm starting to address this question. So the research that I'm focusing on at the moment, uh, for some time, not just right now, um, is looking at this concept or this idea of community-centred practice and helping to build this um, conceptualisation and this practice approach so that we could incorporate this into rural health services to address these health inequities. Um, so the understanding of community-centred practice that I've been developing is that it is a participation-based approach that enables services to be tailored to communities and utilises intervention and strategies that improve health and wellbeing and inclusion at that community level. And that's what we're aiming to do through this practice approach. 
So community-centred practice is about working with communities and being led by communities, not just working within community settings, which is often the case in Australia at the moment. It's about working with rather than on them or on behalf of them, um, but on goals that are identified by the communities themselves. Um, and community-centred interventions follow the principles of client-centred practice, which I think everyone would know, um, in the room would know about, um, but where the client is the entire community. So it's about shifting our focus from that individual level to the community level and thinking about how we partner with communities to um, plan, design, facilitate and evaluate these different health initiatives. So in a review that was done um, for Public Health England recently in the last couple of years by South and colleagues, they identified four key strategies that are part of community-centred practice. So they've identified from a major literature review. So from their literature review, um, they identified that community-centred practice involves, um, one, strengthening communities, um, two, volunteer and peer roles, uh, three, collaborations and partnerships, and four, access to community resources. So this was a multidisciplinary scoping review. Um, so community-centred practice is something that I've come to from my uh, clinical experiences as well. Um, so now I'm researching on this, but it's also something that's really driven by my experience of working in rural health services too. So I thought this example was helpful just to give you that practice insight uh, to help you understand what this could look like in, on the ground. So imagine this. You're an occupational therapist working in a community-based alcohol and drug service. You see a caseload of up to 30 adolescents who present with similar substance use issues and health risks and harms. Seeing the pattern of issues within the community, you realise that a proportion of the problems experienced by young people are caused by community level, social, cultural, political, economic and environmental determinants. So you decide to partner with local young people, with the schools, sports clubs, businesses and organisations to explore and assess community level issues and barriers and to develop community level goals and strategies for interventions that can be implemented in collaboration with them. So this is what community centred practice can look like. But as you can see, you can also identify some of those challenges that I mentioned earlier that might make it hard for this uh, occupational therapist to do this work, such as how do you balance that caseload with the community work, and then how do you source funding to resource this work? Hopefully that gives you an idea of what I mean by community-centred practice. So what I'd like to do now is share some of the research that uh, we've done on this topic of, of looking at community-centred practice um, and what this could look like for the health workforce. Um, so today I'd like to share the findings from the systematic review that we've recently completed and presented here in Australia, um, just to give you some insight of what this looks like. And um, the focus really is uh, giving some insight on what this looks like into occupational therapy, but I'm hoping that that will help us to understand how we could utilise this practice across disciplines as well. So this research was done with Professor Amanda Kenny, who I mentioned earlier, um, but also with Associate Professor Carol McKinstry, who I think has also visited University of Manitoba a couple of times as well, um, and also Dr Chantal Gibson, who's a lecturer at University of Sydney here in Australia too. And the research was funded by the Occupational Therapy Australia Research Foundation. Okay, so it's a systematic review. Um, the systematic review was done through uh, developing the search strategy and we've published a protocol on Prospero and the ID numbers there. Um, we've completed key uh, database searches, including CINAHL, Medline, Scopus, ProQuest Central. Um, we've used Covidence, which is a platform which is useful for screening um, the articles for the systematic review. And we've completed the appraisals using the mixed methods appraisal tool and in vivo has been used for the content analysis. Uh, in our review of uh, occupational therapist practice with communities, we included international literature in English language um, published after 2008, where the, it had to identify an occupational therapist practicing with community. 
Um, but so we've excluded grey literature, non-English, and any articles that didn't include occupational therapists practicing with communities. And that also means that student projects were excluded. Just to give you an idea of the different terms, I'm just going through this part pretty quickly, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about this. And then you can see we first came up with um, 1,748 articles, and after the screening processes, we've had a final total of 24 articles for the appraisal. So what I'd like to do, um, and oh, sorry, and that the articles were of very good quality. So we, a majority of the 24 studies were included. 18 of those met four or five criteria of the mixed methods appraisal tool, um, which means that, yeah, good, very good quality. Um, and uh, what, six only met three or two of the criteria. Okay. So something that was interesting about the findings of this review is that Canada is a popular place for working with communities for occupational therapists. Um, so of the 24 studies that were included, seven of those studies were located in Canada, which is great, which is really good, and another reason why I'm very excited to come visit Canada and talk with you about this research. Um, five of the included studies were from the United States of America, so we've got a large contingent from, from North America. Um, three were located in Australia, three were located in South Africa, two in Brazil, one in Spain, and one in the Netherlands, and this excludes the two articles which are literature reviews. So it's helpful for us to see where occupational therapists have the opportunity to work with communities, and this probably reflects uh, the funding models and opportunities, and also probably the education programs. Oops, sorry. Of the 24 articles, we looked through them to identify the different practice settings where occupational therapists were getting the opportunity to work with communities, because we know this is one of the challenges, right, of having the system and the funding. Um, so what we found was that occupational therapists are located in community health services and primary care, but they're also located in schools, which um, gives us another opportunity to work with communities through schools, uh, religious organisations, government, so particularly local government, uh, non-government organisations and charitable organisations or non-profits, also mental health services and sports and leisure centres. And these are all settings that do have multidisciplinary representation, so I'm thinking this is helpful for us to understand from different discipline perspective as well. And on the other side in the photo, this is me back when I was working for Bendigo Community Health Services running a youth event at one of the local schools. Uh, when we looked through the articles, we also identified what kind of theory, models and frameworks occupational therapists were using to guide their practice. And you can see there's a whole range there that uh, occupational therapists are using. And quite a few of these are multidisciplinary models as well. So probably no surprises in terms of health promotion and community development being the main approaches that occupational therapists use to inform their practice. Um, which is, again, helpful from a multidisciplinary perspective. And then we have some really specific occupational science and occupational therapist models, which is good. It's helpful for us to know as occupational therapists how we can apply those models in this context. Then also social determinants of health, um, community-based rehabilitation, community participation and citizen engagement theory, Indigenous knowledges and cultural safety, ecology, collectivism, place theories, um, Yulom's group theory, because quite a few occupational therapists were running groups, and also universal design, which is about looking at the environment to make it more inclusive. There are quite a few there that some people might find quite relevant. And then we also looked at the different interventions and strategies that they used. And again, these could all be used across disciplines. So we have community education and program development, the group facilitation, building partnerships, health promotion, community development. So there's quite a few here that people might not be surprised to see. Um, but I think one thing that's quite interesting is the diversity of the role that occupational therapists have in community settings, which again could be used to inform other disciplines' development of these community-centred practice roles. Occupational therapists were involved with leadership development, 
with training up peer support workers and volunteer workers, no, volunteer workers, volunteers, um, but also doing things like needs assessment, lots of capacity building, lots of lobbying, political action. Um, and there's also a growing number of uh, occupational therapists looking at disaster preparation, response and management, which could include responding to natural disasters or technology disasters. So that's a new and, and growing area too. So hopefully you can see the, the range of different um, roles, the, the diversity of the role that we can have in community health services um, and how we can be using this role to support these community health initiatives, including in rural health contexts. Okay, so that's just a snapshot of one of the research projects that I've been involved with to help you to get an understanding of how we can build community participation to improve rural health. The conclusions from this project um, are that occupational therapists are utilising community-centred practices in diverse settings. And I think there is evidence for investing in community-level initiatives for improving health outcomes, especially in these rural contexts where we have strengths and opportunities that could be utilised and leveraged for improving and targeting these rural health inequities. I think we need to share our learnings across disciplines to build the capacity of the rural health, allied health workforce, because I know there are other disciplines who are doing this kind of work that we can learn from. And there might be other disciplines who maybe haven't considered this kind of work that would like to, that see the potential and would like to grow that work. And we know we do things better when we work as a multidisciplinary team. Uh, further research is needed to build the evidence base and incorporating consumer and community participation and co-design in the development of these roles, but also the development of interventions. Uh, and the systematic review that I've um, presented a snapshot of today, I think this could be replicated for other health disciplines if they're interested in seeing how community-centred practice looks like in their discipline or how it could be grown in their discipline. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do, just for the final part of the presentation, because I've presented one um, project, I'm involved in a range of projects, and since I am coming over to University of Manitoba, I'd like to just take a few minutes just to give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the other projects I'm involved with, um, because they're kind, there are other research, I suppose, interests that I'd like to be able to meet with people and, and talk with about at University of Manitoba. And just so you can get an idea of the other ways we're tackling these questions about building the rural allied health workforce. So what, one of the other projects, major projects I've been involved with over the last uh, 18 months uh, is an action research project, which is focused on our allied health curriculum and preparing um, allied health professionals for working with diverse communities after they graduate. Um, this project is called Embedding First Nations Health in Occupational Therapy and Social Work Curriculum. So uh, we're working together with social work uh, and with First Nations Health lecturers and experts to improve our curriculum. Um, and we've been doing that through action research. Um, the action research has involved um, curriculum mapping and we've developed tools to support that. It's also involved yarning interviews and focus groups with First Nations educators and students to inform our curriculum development process. We've also done a massive scoping review, which we're looking to publish quite soon. Um, and we've also been building into this process capacity building, particularly capacity building of staff, so our, our lecturers, our tutors, um, and also critical reflection has been a massive part of this action research process as well. And we're all learning together. Um, so this is a project that um, we yeah, have been working on for the past 18 months up to two years, um, which has some important uh, outcomes, um, but it's also something we're continuing to work on um, going forward as well. So it's something I'd like, and I know that there are some people working in the similar work at University of Manitoba, so just, just wanted to share that as well before I look at wrapping up the presentation today. And I'm happy to answer any questions about this project too. And there was just one more project I wanted to mention before I finished as well. So this one is also looking at uh, building the rural allied health workforce, but on the topic of disability and how the rural health professionals work more closely with schools to support children with disability in mainstream schools. 
So for this project, I led the co-design research methods component of the project. Um, it's a massive multidisciplinary project that's had um, national funding. Um, we've we used the co-design with um, health professionals, teachers, education support staff, uh, and parents to develop an education package that can be used to improve um, uh, improve knowledge, build knowledge of the rural and regional uh, workforce, um, and also in a way that's accessible to teachers and to families, so they can improve their knowledge of how to work together to support inclusion of children with disability in mainstream schools. And this is in the context of major policy change in Australia, and we now have a nas national insurance scheme to support people with disability, um, which is called the NDIS, or the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So again, I'm happy to answer questions about this, um, but it also might be something that I could connect with people about in our University of Manitoba as well, whether it's about the, the project or whether it's about the co-design methods. Okay, just to finish up, so yes, I will be at University of Manitoba in April 2020. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Um, the key themes are about building healthy rural communities um, through participation. So my focus is on rural health research, um, but I'm also interested in the, the participation-based methods that go with that, um, working with communities, the workforce development, and also workforce development through education, which includes teaching and learning in First Nations health and intercultural education and building graduates' cultural capabilities. Um, so again, I'd just really like to thank um, Leanne Leclerc for organising this presentation today, making this opportunity available to me, uh, and Leanne Allen for organising behind the scenes for the technology. Um, so thanks very much for listening too. Is our mic on? Not yet. All right, we're good. Thanks so much, Narada. Uh, I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions, and I have a couple, but I'll extend it to the audience first. I've, we've got a microphone, sort of. I'm the walking microphone. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Does anybody here have anything they'd like to ask? At this point? Yeah, Gail? Hi, Norita. It's Gail Restall. How are you? Um, Thanks for being here. I, um, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. So one of the things thank that you. I have been... Um, thinking about uh, is uh, whether there is any benefit in um, stopping to talk about communities as clients and seeing mm -hmm. a community as its own entity and not trying to make that relationship um, between mm -hmm. communities and clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it. Yeah, just I agree a, with just, you. Just, I think a, just a moment. The uh, te technological people here has requested that you stop sharing your screen. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> then we see you instead of your slides. <laughs> um, anyway, so my question is: um, Do you think there's any benefit in doing that? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I mean, I'm in two minds. Um, I would like to shift away from that language, but I have found when I talk with health professionals working in rural community health services that this is language that they understand. Um, so, yes, I agree, but I can also see the value of using that as a concept, helping people think about client-centred care and then making a shift from individual as client to community as client. So maybe... We will get there soon, but I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Leslie. I just I have a question about one of the resources that you were referring to that I hadn't heard of, and I wonder if you can speak to Healthy People 2020. Ah, this is American policy, so I'm not the expert on this either, but um, from what I've read, it's American public health policy. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's referred to in quite a few of the community participation studies in the US context uh -huh. outside of the systematic review, so I have come across that before, um, and has been a driver for major funding for these community-based 
pro- uh, health promotion projects in the US. Um, but I'm not sure what the outcomes are because we're getting close to 2020, so it'll be interesting to see that. Merritt, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the rural health component of the school and the curriculum and how many students you have, I think just for uh, everyone's knowledge, how many students are coming through the program? Uh, Latrobe Rural Health School? Yeah, in the OT program. Um, uh Uh-huh, okay, yes. So um, our occupational therapy course is delivered to 40 students per year level. Um, So we have a, a... probably about 200 students because we run a double degree program as well as a master's program. Um, So across the year levels, we probably have about 200 students. And just to put that into context, our Melbourne program has about 100, up to 100, 140 students per year level. So it's it's much larger. Um, Our rural uh, program includes rural students and our statistics from last year were that 90% of our students were from rural backgrounds which we're really proud of, um, and many of our graduates go on to work in rural locations. Again, I would say that's probably about the 90%. It's usually only one or two per year level that go on to work in city locations. So um, that's one of the objectives of having a rural health school, and we're, we're meeting those objectives, which, yeah, we're, we're proud of that. Yeah, that's great. And I think, you know, as Barb alluded to, the department head in physical therapy and some of what we've talked about, we're exploring how we prepare our graduates for more of a rural health context. And I wonder, you spoke a lot today about community participation and the health of communities, and I'm wondering how you manage that tension around individual client service delivery and the needs in those areas related to rural health and the community participation or community health components and how you're maybe addressing that in your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's one thing we can do is addressing it through curriculum. Um, So we're including um, macro level or population level uh, health subjects where we are teaching students about how to work with communities. Um, Our program has had a project-based learning subject embedded in our course for a long time, um, probably yeah, a very long time, where students in the, as their capstone project go out to work with communities uh, and do an industry-based project. Um, but we're actually through, um, we just said national funding, I won't go too much into this because it's quite complicated, but federal government funding, which recognises us as a rural health school, Uh, which means we've had additional funding to build a new subject into first year as well, which is called Rural Community Engagement. So now we're getting in at first year, I actually think we're going to have better outcomes for the workforce. So in first year, students will go out as multidisciplinary teams and work with rural communities on a health issue identified by the community. And um, they'll probably have a health promotion focus or health education focus. Um, but we'll be delivering that subject for the first time next year because of this new federal government funding. So that means in our occupational therapy program, we'll be working with communities in first year and in their final year, and I think that will lead to better outcomes for the rural health workforce as well. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. That's excellent. Mm. I suppose the other aspect is I hope by doing the research we're impacting on um, the knowledge base but also on policy and helping policymakers to see the opportunities for shifting those funding models and creating more opportunities for community-centred roles in health services which have traditionally been individual focused even in a community setting. Yeah, you have that opportunity to show both, right, and across that continuum. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the back here. I'm going to relay it to you through her. She's going to say it, and then I'll say it in the microphone. (laughs) So our interprofessional fieldwork coordinator would like to know uh, what professions are involved in that project, and how long are they in the community? Mm -hmm. Um, For the new first year subject, it is interprofessional. So we have 11 disciplines across the rural health school and it will be available to all of them. Um, So that includes um, physiotherapy, exercise physiology, speech pathology, uh, oral health, dentistry, uh, pharmacy, 
kind of list all 11 now, but all of them. So in first year, that project will be available to all of them. So we are trying to plant the seed that rural health professionals do work with communities very early on in, across all disciplines. Um, for the capstone project, that is occupational therapy specific. Um, but they go out and work in industry and predominantly not with occupational therapy supervisors. So there is an interprofessional aspect in that respect. Mm -hmm. And how long are the placements? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. First year, um, that will be a whole semester. So for us, that's 12 weeks. And for part of that, they go and stay with the community in accommodation, which I think will be for at least one week. Um, but after that, they might do visits. Um, in the final capstone project, that's a 10-week project um, where it's full-time. So probably at least three days a week, they're working on their project in the community. Just to clarify, you said it's available to them. Does that mean it's required? Mm -hmm. So everyone in it, all of the disciplines? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, not required for all disciplines, but it is a core subject for quite a number of those. It's brand new next year, so I don't have the definite list in front of me in terms of which one it's core for and which one it's elective. Um, but it would be core for, just thinking off the top of my head, at least half of those disciplines that I can think of. Excellent. Hmm. Boy, one more quick question, and and I don't even um, know whether this whether you can answer this or if it's relevant. But one of the things we struggle with when we look at our cohort mm -hmm. is we have most students from Winnipeg, and very few from mm -hmm. the rural. And whether mm. that was a challenge for you, and how we build the sense of it, this is an option for our more rural students? Mm, mm. Uh, yeah, and look, I'm not sure what the distances are like for you, um, but that example of the Muldura campus, for example, which is part of our Latrobe Rural Health School, which is a four hour drive from the Bendigo campus. Um, we do have students that come from Muldura, but we know how hard it is for them. Um, some of our courses are delivered in their entirety on that Muldura campus, so nursing, social work, are delivered in full at the Muldura campus, which makes it much more accessible for those students. Um, but for the students that do need to travel into the main campus, it is it is hard for them. And I know um, we're trying, and with that federal government funding, there are scholarships available to try and support those students. And because we have smaller class sizes here at the Bendigo campus, we do have um, much, I think we have very personal relationships with our students and we do what we can to really support them to um, stay in the course and, and complete the course. Um, but it is a challenge. It's something we're always, you know, looking at how we can do better. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much, Narada. That gave us a really good overview of some of the different areas we can be working with you on when you come in April and we're really looking forward to your visit. We didn't even get into the Indigenous health content, but there's certainly a lot going on here that will be, um, you know, mm. great things we can collaborate on. In addition to the children with disabilities, uh, looking at mm. some of the uh, um, integration. And so we have some partners here who will also let them know that you're interested in that area and mainstreaming, and we'll, we'll put you in touch with them when you're here. So a few months mm. away, hopefully uh, you can go get some sleep now after having been up most of the night preparing. <laughs> Thanks again so much for getting up so early and sharing your, your research with us. Oh, thank you for staying back this afternoon because I know these lectures are usually done a little bit earlier for you. So thank you for doing that. And I did um, you know, put those other researchers' names up as well. So if anyone is interested in other projects or would like connections with people from other disciplines, I'm very happy to support those connections as well. I think this partnership between La Trobe University and University of Manitoba is really important and has so many opportunities. So I'm really grateful to be involved in it and I would really like to support other people to engage with that too. Okay, great. Well, you have a few of us coming to see you <laughs> in January to March, although you'll be here and they'll be there. So it'll all be great. <laughs> so thanks so much. And we'll be in touch soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Narada. Bye -bye. I'll sign off. Okay.